I was about 11 when I got my first phone and I started using social media. Um, the main platform I would use was Instagram. So very image oriented, very, very image oriented. Right, and right. Um, yeah, right. it further reinforced and worsened my, my body image issues. And um, I was just force fed a lot of content that was just very difficult to take in. This is an interview with Jordan Peterson. You can find the full interview up over on YouTube, and it's definitely worth watching. Uh, Famous detransitioner Chloe Cole interviews with him. It's the best interview we've seen, and I'm very glad Jordan Peterson did it because I don't think anyone else could have interviewed in the same way with his uh, background in psychology. And this is just further direct correlation between kids that use social media, especially at young ages, unsupervised. There is a direct correlation between that social media usage and becoming gender dysphoric. At the beginning, they told my parents, like, your child will be at risk of suicide if you don't affirm her identity. But it wasn't until after I started the treatments that I started feeling like, feeling like committing suicide. And this, is, this story is not unique at all. We are seeing more and more of this become very rampant, and it is about to get worse with the absolute affirming model that they are pushing. And she's saying she didn't even feel suicidal till they pumped her full of hormones. And imagine that, throwing off your entire endocrine system would make you feel depressed or suicidal or off in some way, like you're living in the wrong body. And this is a study that's touted by the left right now. It's a new study. They're very excited about it, proving that you can improve the mental health I- outcomes of children. And so let's take a minute to quickly destroy this study. Mm-hmm. So this is the core claim of the study. They say, we observed 60% lower odds of depression and 73% lower odds of suicidality. A young, youth, a young youth who had initiated PBs or GHAs compared with youths who had not. And that's puberty blockers or cross-sex hormones. And they're saying that this improved the outcomes for them. Mm-hmm. And it should be noted that this was only done over a very short period. This is a 12-month study. So only 12 months after they started taking these drugs. Mm-hmm. And they're shouting this study as a massive success. And secondarily... It is an extremely small sample size for this type of study. 104 youth. They start with 169, whittled it down to 104. And then of those, only they had follow-ups at 3, 6, and 12 months. 80% followed up at 3 months and 6 months. At 12 months, only 62% followed up at 12 months. Mm -hmm. Why didn't they follow up? Likely the most depressed among them didn't follow up with them. Or who knows, maybe they committed suicide and they didn't follow up to find out what happened there. So they didn't even have follow-up on this study. And the most damning piece of evidence of all of this is the fact that they did not even adjust for if they were taking antidepressants or not. Mm -hmm. So here here they say that uh, they didn't adjust for um, psychotropic medications, antidepressants. And you would assume that if they start getting more depressed, they would start getting more depressed and then they'd be prescribed those medications. Mm -hmm. They'd be prescribed those. And indeed, we find that in the short term... It is important to note that we observed a transient and non-significant worsening in mental health outcomes in the first several months of care among all participants and that these outcomes subsequently returned to baseline by 12 months. And they didn't actually adjust for that. And we know that this gender clinic knew this study was happening. And they had a vested interest in this being a positive study for them. So they would be have an uh, interest in pumping these children full of happy pills, ensuring the outcomes are what they want. And we know that many of those pills in the short term have positive outcomes. So the study's garbage from the beginning. My endocrinologist asked me some questions that were... Very adult in nature. I was basically being sexualized by my doctors. Um, they, it was like, are you, are you aware that you may experience vaginal atrophy? Or are you aware that this may affect your ability to have children as an adult? And I just went along with it. It was like, oh, yeah, I know that. I don't, I don't plan on having kids. And I also hadn't had, I, hadn't, right. I never had sex by that point. So I, I didn't know just what what effect any of that would have on my body. But I was being treated as if I were an adult with the mental faculties to be able to consent to all this and understand what I was consenting to. But I wasn't. I was just a kid. The real question we have to ask ourselves again and again is can any child meaningfully 
meaningfully consent to bodily mutilation. Yeah, can they meaningfully consent to chemical or surgical mutilation? Is that something a child can actually consent to? No. The way it was explained to me, I guess because I was young and they were trying to make it more digestible to a 15-year-old, was that they would they would um, leave like a deep scrape, deep scrapes on both sides of my chest, kind of like a deep knee scrape, but more, more controlled. And they would, they would remove my nipples and then place them in that area of scraped skin in a, they called it a more masculine positioning and shape. It's barbaric yeah. to say the least. And when I took the dressings off, when I looked down, they were the graphs. They were, they were black because, you know, they during the, during the surgery during the operation the blood supply was cut off and so the outer layer of skin had died, and they said that that was how it was supposed to be and that was just part of the process. But I couldn't bear to see that part of my body. I and I had to see that every night. I had to, I had to change my. I had to. That was what I had to look at every single night, after every bath, after every shower. Monsters. This is a devastating interview. The problem with me starting it so young was not only that I couldn't consent, I couldn't really fathom the full, just the full picture of things. Um, I've also experienced, I'm still experiencing a wide range of complications to this day. Um, you know, from the, the surgery you know, I'll never be able to breastfeed. Um, I'll never have that erogenous sensation in my chest back. Um, I, I'll never have my breast back. A reconstruction will do nothing for me, and it might make things worse, actually, because I'm, I've, I've had some complications pop up this year with the grafts. They, I have to cover them up, them up with bandages or else they, they'll... I don't know what's going on with them. I tried to consult my surgeon about it and he didn't really didn't really didn't really investigate he gave me advice that made my the complications worse even and actually temporarily gave me an infection but i have to wear i have to bandage up every day so that it doesn't like leak all over my clothing or bedding and jesus from the from the the hormones and blockers um I've been experiencing some joint pains, mainly in my, my arms, my legs, and my back. And uh, yep. I, I still have issues with my, my urinary tract. I have to use the, re the restroom pretty frequently. And I didn't even know that this was possible. This is like a pretty huge quality of life issue that I'm experiencing. And I'm just, I'm just not really getting any help for it. And on top of that, I'm, I do, I do hate to speak about it, but I'm experiencing sexual dysfunction at the age of 18. That's something that women usually go through when, when they're in their 40s to 50s. Right, right. How was I supposed to know? <laughs> this is such a devastating interview. Um, you know, I was Army Infantry, and I can't even remember the last time I've, I've really cried. And every single time I watch this interview, and I watched it, you know, many times getting getting ready just to do this video and editing up, and it it's so hard to keep it together watching that and I just imagine that happening to my daughter and thousands of children going through this right now and it, it's so devastating and Jordan Peterson feels it too. Chloe, thank you very much for talking to me today and I'm really, it's really, uh, what happened to you is really unforgivable in my estimation. You know, it's, you were very badly mishandled by the people who should have been taking care of you on the professional front. I suspect that the medical community who's been complicit in this kind of butchery has an awful shock waiting for them on the legal front. So that certainly started to manifest itself in the UK. 
with the closing of the Tavistock Clinic. And I think there's a thousand lawsuits right now pending in relationship to the Tavistock Clinic. So the tide is beginning to turn. And when it turns, there's going to be an awful lot of uh, reparations made on the part of, of culpable medical professionals and their counseling acolytes. I absolutely think that he is right, that these monsters will pay for what they have done to these young children. <laughs>